when I saw this question, because I had the opportunity to review some of these questions, what came to mind um, was attempting to address the question from a more fundamental level, which is how do you respond to ethical dilemmas generally? All right, so that I'm not just responding to this beer question, I'm also attempting to give perspective on any other kind of situation you find yourself that may warrant that you choose from two close substitutes, quote unquote, where you can give good reasons for any decision you make, but you need to go with just one. Um, now, the reason why you're asking this question is because you're a Christian and you have you know, moral values to protect. I mean, you will not buy a drink for anyone, and neither should you sponsor the increased expansion of this drink being marketable and getting in the hands of people to destroy their lives, pretty much. So you're wondering, should you do this on a professional basis, assuming that it is not a drink they're applying it to, or um, do you have to say no to that gig because of what it's been applied to? So three things that I'll share with you with respect to how to handle ethical dilemmas. The first one, the law of separation. What I mean by that is you need to learn to separate the principle from the principal. The principle from the principle. That there are a number of things that... Honestly, if you go down the route of, I won't do something simply because it is essentially applied to something wrong, there are a lot of things will probably not be involved in. For example, um, you will invest in a sugar company. You will invest in um, butter. In, in anything that has to do, or that could be abused. Anything. As, I mean, cholesterol, sugar. Um, a number of things that we could say right now that are very useful, but if in the hands of an evil principal can easily be weaponized and turned evil very, very quickly. Alcohol is used primarily, well, I won't use the word primarily, but is used in a lot of context for pharmaceutics, for drugs, and a number of other very beneficial things. Um, so you need to learn to separate the principle, the concepts, like money, from an evil owner of money. Do you understand? Because um, Jesus did not say money is evil. He said it is the love of money that becomes the root of all evil. So if you learn to separate the principle from the principal owning and holding that thing, you may be able to see more clearly exactly where and how you should apply yourself to that particular context. I'm going to answer this question more specifically at the end of this three-step, quote-unquote, um, principle that I'm sharing with you. The first thing, separate the principle from the principle, and then you're able to see more clearly. That is, whatever it is you're saying, should you do or should you not do? remove the context and put another thing there and see if it still applies. And then you can tell more clearly whether or not it makes sense to go down this route. The second thing is check with your conscience. Um, check with your conscience. Ask yourself, and how, you, how, how do you know if your conscience is approving of something? The evidence is how do you justify it in the presence of other believers? So imagine that there is an audience of believers you want to justify your decisions before. And then what are you going to say? All right, whatever it is you'll be saying is what is likely going to be the justification for your conscience to not raise alarm bells. And so you need to check with your conscience. Can you really justify this with all sincerity before other believers? Whatever reasons you would come up with most likely would be the basis for the justifications. All right, for that issue. And if you cannot defend it and all you're just doing is looking for straws to hold on to, obviously your conscience is not right with that decision. And then lastly... Um, Lastly, I would say, engage in what I call financial dissonance. What I mean by that is this. Um, if money was not a motive or an incentive, would you still do this thing? If there was no money attached to that gig, would you go ahead and help a beer company to expand their businesses to sell more beers? Would you do that if there was no money involved? Now, if there was no money involved, if you will not do it, that means you are doing it primarily for the money. And if you are doing it primarily for the money, you should not do it. Because your conscience is not likely going to be aligned with it. Did you hear that? Did you get that? That is, engage in what I call financial dissonance. If you will do something, if you will do something whether or not money is involved, it is a sign that you are predisposed to doing it and it's aligned with your general moral values and compass. If you remove the monetary element or the financial element to this particular engagement, if you will no longer be interested in doing it because of the, perhaps, utility, net negative, remember that concept, because of the utility component, that is, it's not likely going to bless the families of the earth. 
So I'm not sure I want to engage in this. If you will still go ahead and do that, which you know that without the money, you will not be incentivized to do it. But then you go ahead and do it because of the money. That means you're doing it only because of the money. Now, these are three things that I've shared with you. This particular question may pass the first test because beer or alcohol by itself as a principle may not be wrong. It's amoral. It becomes immoral in the hands of someone who is immoral. Do you understand? So it can then be abused. The same way sugar can be abused. But you may not have the same issue with sugar because it is not in the finished. So what I mean by that is alcohol is not necessarily beer. Beer is already distilled to be consumed to heighten pleasure and dull senses. Remember we talked about debauchery and revelings on Thursday. Do you see? So beer is already packaged to be abused. It's, a, it's packaged to be abused. It's not the alcohol of pharmaceutics that I'm talking about when it comes to beer. Beer is designed to be abused. You, you, you can't have, uh, you know, uh, five bottles on your table and the beer company is excited that that is all you are taking. They want you to have more. It is incentivized to wreck lives. You cannot be... Um, you cannot be a beer marketer and not necessarily be a counselor at the same time because you're likely going to be counseling a lot of people whose lives are going a wire. And you are, as you are marketing the beer, you, are, you know, the way bartenders are like, you know, good counselors, you know, because as they are giving you the weapon of destruction, they are also giving you soothing balm just to make it more beery, but you are dying, you are dying slowly, you understand, because that's the way you can keep coming back because this, the sense that, okay, I'm getting help at least, even though I'm dulling my senses, so ultimately, this thing does not necessarily help, and that is what beer is really about. Uh, and I doubt if someone can safely consume beer in, a, in the most uh, moderate way without increasing in intensity, the way drugs can be abused. Remember, we talked about this on Thursday as well. You, you take a sniff of heroin, you're not likely going to take the exact same measure of sniff the next time. You're likely going to increase the intensity, the volume, the quality, you want to get the coke that is just coming from the bakery, where, wherever they create it. Do you understand? So that you can get a heightened pleasure. And by the next time, it's not going to measure up again. You will need something more. And that is the same category that beer is categorized under. So as far as alcohol is concerned, it may pass that first test. But beer as a product by itself may not pass the first test. And if it doesn't pass the first test, it's not like going to pass the second test of conscience. If it doesn't pass the second test of conscience, the reason why you want to do that kind of thing only is because of the financial gain. And if this uh, decision does not pass this three-step metric, I would suggest that you don't go ahead with that kind of decision. Now, it's, it may sound a bit complicated, but trust me, you want to keep with the voice of your conscience. Because there's a way you can dull your conscience to an extent that it will keep speaking, but you will, no, you will no longer hear them because you have dulled them, you have seared it, you have added layers and layers of earbuds and stuff on top of that conscience. So you are no longer capable capable of uh, perceiving what the conscience is saying. So in directly answering this question, I would say, no, go for the one that you can be able to do and then sleep at night without thinking you offended God or sponsor the destruction of other people's lives. That's what I would say. Thank you, sir. As soon as you said um, the money part, where if you're doing the family because of money, I could hear somebody say, hmm. <laughs> I shifted on chair like, okay, here we go again. <laughs> yeah, so um, thank you so much, sir. Uh, so, I'll be expecting questions from the audience. Um, so, is there anybody that has a question yet? Okay, you'd like to ask a question. Can we get... Thank you. Like three questions before we go to the audience. Yeah. Okay, just, sorry. We'll take like two quest three questions here, and then we'll and come we'll to your to question. The yes, thank you. Uh, so, the next question here is... Hmm, this is funny. <laughs> What's the best way to avoid gossip at work? <laughs> Good remote, right? <laughs> nice one. <laughs> the best way to avoid gossip at work is to be an insulator to gossip. Don't be a conductor. All right. The moment electricity meets with an insulator, it stops to transmit. It can no longer continue. So have all the tendencies of an insulator. And gossip is not designed to stop. It is designed to continue to fly. It's a rumor. It's rumor mongering. 
So when rumor comes on your desk, ask all the relevant questions that will force the gossip to be disinterested in continuing the gossip with you. Oh, wow. Did, were you there? You can, you can ask sincerely, but of course, sarcastically. Like, were you there? Oh, you were not there. Ah, oh, I see. That means a reliable source of, you know, news must have shared it with you. Oh, not necessarily. It was from a friend. Oh, how close is the friend to this person? Not really close. Just saw it on the blog. Oh, I see. Uh, okay, so what do you want me to do about this information <laughs> you're sharing with me now? Uh, no, no, as far as vibes, no, as far as gist. Oh, I see. Okay, now I've heard. I've heard. I've heard the gist. I've heard the gist. Very well received. <laughs> There is no real gossip that is going to enjoy all of those back and forth questions. That will be the last time they will come to your desk with hot gossip. That, that will be the last time because that's not what the gossip wants. The gossip wants other things to, other people to fan the flames of the rumor and get it more exciting. And of course, in the process of doing that, you will add things, you will exaggerate, you will add, you will embellish, you will, you know, you will add things to make it more juicy. And by the time it's packaged and sent to the next desk, it's a lot redder, it's more attractive, it's hotter. You understand? And, th and that's how gossip is designed to run. I remember gossip is a type of what? On Thursday. The type of murder. All right, when you take either a life or someone's dignity or reputation, whether by an act of violence or by malice, all right, that is murdered. And that's why the Bible calls it murders, not murder. Just not murdered, but murders. That types of murders. Praise God. And gossip is a type of murder. And so uh, when someone comes to your desk with gossip, you can ask all the relevant questions that will make the person feel very disinterested. And that's probably the nicest way to do it. There are other ways with a bit more violence, like this should be the last time you come to my desk with this kind of information. I do not need to hear it. Okay? Uh, you, you can you understand. Or the person is talking and you are totally disinterested. You don't contribute at all. The person just continues and feels like a fool. You understand? The person has finished talking and dissecting everything, and the person is chewing the stick of the person that they are, you know, uh, slandering, and they are done with, after the person is done, you hear them and you're like, okay. You hear all of that, and then you just respond with an okay. That's the last time. So there are several ways. If you need more of this, uh, you, can, <laughs> you can reach out to me. All right, but yeah, there are several ways you can do it. Or you can keep checking your time while the person is speaking. You know, you know, you don't want to treat a gossip nicely. You don't want to because you don't want it to come again the next time. Because the next one, you might, you might be more predisposed to, you know, attending to it. You just don't, you don't, want, you don't want to be seen as the person that is a fertile ground for gossip to thrive. You don't want to be seen like that. All right, so that, that's a, those are some of the ways you can stop gossip at work and anywhere else pretty much. I can, I can tell you that perhaps sometimes gossip even happens more in church than at work. So you need to carry the same disposition everywhere you go, all right? And like, I think I mentioned this the last time this kind of question was asked, that it is not every time you talk about somebody in third person that is gossip, okay? So it's not like whenever somebody's talking about somebody else, it's always gossip, no. It is whenever you're talking to someone else about someone else with the intention to libel, slander, lie against or exaggerate what somebody has done in a very negative light. That is when it becomes gossip. If you're talking about someone, you're, you know, you're talking about someone reverently, you're talking about someone respectfully, admirably, you are referring someone, you're recommending someone. The guy that recommended David to Saul was not gossiping about David to Saul. He was recommending David to Saul. The butler was not gossiping about Joseph to, the, to Pharaoh. He was recommending all right, so there are several scenarios we find in Scripture, but the moment you start talking ill about someone, all right, just to create a sense of, you know, just to spotlight the person in a very bad light, or, and it's not an objective evaluation of issues, it's just slander, then that's gossip. Like what Absalom was doing at the gates, you know, helping people to fall more in love with him and almost slandering, you know, King David, that he does not have time for you guys, don't worry, he has other things he's attending to, and he's seen as the great guy. That has, of course, no, a number of other connotations beyond gossip. But one of the things that he must have done there is distort the reality of our people's perception about David. And, and, and that would categorize as gossip as well. So um, not everything is gossip. But when you recognize that this is gossip, people cannot verify the information they are sharing with you about somebody else. And you cannot do anything directly to, in, to improve the situation. Why are they telling you exactly? So and that, that qualifies for gossip. Thank you.
Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Great. Um, so one more question before we go to the audience. Um, so this is a relationship question. Um, in the aspect of marriage and relationship, sir, he says, is there anything wrong in the lady being older than the man? <laughs> so Leko has responded violently. <laughs> OK, so good question. Um, it depends on the people involved. That's what I would say. It depends on the people involved. There are no right and wrongs when it comes to opinions. But you've got to be willing to bear the social implication of your opinions. The reason why this is a question is because of the social attitude of the culture you know, about things like that. If the social culture uh, was predisposed to, you know, is welcoming to that idea, like generally, this would not have been a question. Yeah. You see. The reason why that person is asking is probably Probably because the person wants a bit more justification beyond just liking this other person that is older than. Mm -hmm. And I believe that this person is probably a guy, right? So you're marrying a lady that is older than you, yeah. and you are not sure if you should go ahead. Yeah. If you're already thinking that you need some measure of social opinionated acceptance mm -hmm. to believe that it is okay to go ahead, you probably should not be going ahead. Because the pressure will increase when you get married to that person. Mm -hmm. If you're going to get married to someone that's older than you, do so because you believe it's the right thing to do. Do so because you love this person. Do so because you can live with the social pressure of all the questions that people would ask you in parties and wherever else you go. I just discovered your wife's age. <laughs> how are you coping? You know, there's a way gossips do. They know how to enter. You know, how are you they cope now? <laughs> what do you mean by that? It's like, <laughs> you know, so. Uh, my point is, there will be pressure. Yeah. There will be pressure. Remember that meme or that pressure mawa. You get <laughs> pressure will come, and you must be willing to bear it and not feel like, oh, the pressure is increasing. So maybe I should go and increase the number of people that are also believing with me that it's okay. If if you're already starting from that tangent of is it okay? Can I do it? And then when ten people say it's okay, then you feel more confident in doing it. You probably should not. Because those 10 people will not always be there to tell you, it's okay, it's okay. There will be more people that will be telling you, why are you doing that? Like, or give you snide comments or snide remarks or make a gesture almost like pitying you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> well done. Oh. I don't understand. Which work am I doing? <laughs> do you get? So just do this because you want to. God has led you to. Yeah. But as far as God is concerned, there are no issues, really. It's, it's, a, it's a decision of the two people involved in the relationship, not a societal you know, consensus. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's what I would say about that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Can we appreciate Pastor? Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, how many people have questions in the audience? Um, one. Let's go I have for one it. person. Is there another person? One. Okay. Thank you. Um, hi, Pastor. Hi, church. Good to see you. Okay, um, a relationship question. Okay. Well, um, a bit of story, right? Wow. So, <laughs> so I used to um, live a very unhealthy life, and I decided to retrace my steps back to God. And serving God is really sweet, I must say. Ooh. So, um, within the space of one month, I got a job that like was really paying me crazy money as a student. So. Wow. A whole lot of things changed for me, and that was really amazing. And I was like enjoying the presence of God till I met somebody. <laughs> so, um, this somebody is a nice guy, he's fine, everything. <laughs> and then I was like, hello, brother. If we are going to have a relationship, I want to be celibate. I mean, as a Christian, we are not meant to do this mm. outside marriage. And the next thing I heard is sex cannot be off the table. I was like, oh, they don't mean that. And it was like, <laughs> it was like, I mean it. If we are going to have a thing, it's, and I was like, boy, you are a Christian. You go to a popular church. I was like, and so? I was like, oh. And I tried opening to the book of Galatians where the Bible was talking about. <laughs> okay. That maybe I can 
talk to him, maybe he can see it. And he was like, please don't say that, don't bring this. I like having things my way. I like doing things my way. And I'm just giving him a straight answer. So I was like, I was like, if this is going to happen, then we'll have to end our relationship. And it was like, I don't mean it. I was like, oh, does it look like I'm laughing? Or does it look like I'm <laughs> smiling? And then I'm like, if you cannot, if you can tell me that I should not open the Bible to show you what we both know is the truth. So what's the guarantee that I am safe in this relationship? And now it has really been an issue though. Like we're going back and forth, back and forth. Okay. But well, I'm praying for him, Shad. I got Interesting. Are you out of the relationship already? Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but you're still friends. Okay. So is this really a question? <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> okay, so what's your question? You don't convince them. They have their minds set. It's not your job to convince people like that. You show them the truth. You allow the truth to do its work in their hearts. You don't try to convince them. But as far as relationships go, it's a deal breaker for you. Sorry, you have to move along. You get, which is what you've already done. You already moved along, told him there's no deal here, all right? Um, but what I would even want to say is to backtrack a little bit, you know, um, and maybe also help so that you can discern people who are like that before you get to the point of, you know, you're in a relationship or you're having a conversation around, oh, sex would be off the table or not on the table if there will be a table in the first place. You know, um, you should, the way you go about choosing who you are even considering needs to be reworked. It's like the recruitment process of an organization. If you realize that, you keep sacking people because there's no cultural fit. Eventually, you sack them, but maybe the real problem is how do you go about, what's the metric that you use in recruiting your staff? What are the value systems you look out for, all right, so that you can reduce the attrition? So in, in this case, so that there will be no issues of, okay, we almost worked and then we didn't work again. Or we worked for a month and then we said no to each other and there was a breakup and there was a, you know, a heartache or something. How about you reconfigure the process with which you approach or even evaluate guys generally, you know, beyond the, big, or should I say the common metrics like it's fine, he has money, it's cool, all of those vibe things. The tech bro too, you know, so he checks all the boxes except for the most important box. <laughs> so, so you need to ensure that you check the right thing. So I would recommend you go to SoundCloud, like uh, Minister Tengod has advised us. Listen to the teaching series from LOML, especially The Life of My Love, all right, and then this year's as well. All right, but last year's one will perhaps address this more. Because be, before the person becomes the love of your life, you need to check with the quality of life that person has. All right, so that, that's the whole objective of the, of the teaching. So you need to go back there, okay? I'd ask you if, you if you listen to it. All right. As an answer's questions, you used to, you used to fear me. <laughs> so wait, let's, let's come to Pastor Nonso later. Falake is, <laughs> Falake is raising her hand. Any other person? Okay. So let's, let's have Falake. Or well, you can start speaking and project <laughs> before the mic comes. If in this um, dispensation, in the new covenant, yeah. like we all have access to the prophetic, mm. what is the responsibility or what is the function of a prophet in the new... Powerful questions. Um, Powerful questions. <laughs> so good. So, how many hours do you have? <laughs> I'll start by recommending a teaching, all right, which is uh, the spirit of prophecy, all right. It's a it was a calm teaching, um, it was a calm teaching, right? Last year um, on the series Daniel series, right? It was the excellent spirit, yes. So look out for that teaching. I think it was almost an hour, almost two hours thereabouts. It was a calm, but it was very exhaustive in addressing the issue of the prophetic, the role of prophets, and what their primary assignment really is. I obviously cannot go so far into you know, explaining 
all of that in detail right now. But one of the things that, um, there are several things that a prophet does, but the major thing that they do is to testify of Jesus Christ through teaching, teaching. And of course, whilst that teaching is going on, there will be utterances. And it will be more dominant in the ministry of a prophet than perhaps another ministry gift. There will be a lot of utterances. You see, a prophet uses a number of tools to do his job, and he may have a heightened manifestation of some gift of the Spirit, like the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, prophecy, those revelational gifts, and all the utterance gifts as well will be more dominant in the ministry of a prophet. And the objective of those manifestations will not necessarily be to allude capacity to see and be revealed to spiritual things, all right? He won't allude those capacities to himself, like we've seen in many contexts where it's almost like a show. It's almost like a performance. You know, the reciting of someone's phone number does not bless anybody. It does not bless the person. It does not bless you. It doesn't bless anyone listening to it. You're just giving an information that anybody can get by asking the person, what's your phone number? It doesn't edify. It doesn't comfort. It doesn't... So why are you saying it? Even if you know it, why? What's the motive? And that's how you begin to know that, see, some motives are not right. The testimony of Jesus, the Bible says, is the spirit of prophecy. That's how you authenticate prophecy. How much of Jesus is inside it? How much of Jesus is inside it? How much edification, comfort encouragement comes from that utterance? Or is it just, you know, judgment? You call people out, you mention all their life history just to embarrass them, shame them, and then get them to cry and call you a prophet. To what end? So at the end of the day, you are the center of that prophetic manifestation and no longer Jesus. And those are some of the ways you can tell that this person is actually not a real prophet. So the accuracy of a prophetic manifestation is not what confers, you know, the role of a prophet to a person. It is how much of Jesus that person actually establishes, all right, by teaching and also by utterance. So there are several times, now I may not call myself a prophet, but there are a lot of times that I teach prophetically, where someone comes to church and I'm teaching Bible, I'm teaching the Word of God, but someone is coming and is hearing exactly what is going on in their lives, and that happens literally every time I teach. And then they come and they say, you know, Pastor, it was as if you were talking to me, and I was not talking to anybody. I was just teaching God's word, and utterance came, I ministered to someone, and the person felt that God was talking to them, and they felt instructed by the word of God, all right? Uh, and there are people who, even when they get specific stuff about people, the objective is not to just mention it and put the spotlight on themselves. They may even choose to call for a personal meeting and have that personal conversation because of perhaps the nature or the sensitivity of the information that they receive from God about that person. If the objective is to really help the person, then it should not include embarrassing the person. If it is really to help the person, it cannot be that I have to embarrass you first before. And many of these manifestations sometimes involve the embarrassment of the, the said people. And it almost makes them feel like victims. But, you know, at the end of the day, it is to authenticate someone's shoulder pad and make the person feel more prophetic, you know. Now, I'm not saying that it is wrong to call people out and give specific words that it is still part of the department of utterance and especially as you are led as the minister of the gospel. But if love is not visibly seen through the manifestations of those gifts, you can judge that this person's motive is wrong. Love has to be there. It can't be to bring people down, pull people down, tear them down, embarrass them, bring out uncomfortable details about their lives. And, you know, there's something Papa Debo used to do, which I thought was very, um, you know, um, it's, a, it's a loving way to do these things, right? So, you know, back then I used to go to camp a lot and, you know, about reserve the most ugly situations till the end of his teachings. And he will call out some incredible cases that you would, you would imagine if people would actually step out. And you'll see them stepping out in their hundreds and in their thousands. You'll be hearing cases like you, you wake up at night to eat from the bean, you know, things like that, as ugly as those situations are. So what he does is this. He will mention at least three or four situations together. You mention all of them together because he probably needs you to come out. And of course, you have to put context in, into this. He's talking to about five million people at the same time. I can't be meeting with five million individual issues in a private, you know, I have to call everybody out. Do you understand? So at his level, he may not be able, he may not have any other opportunity to call them out and minister to them apart from that platform. And so what does he do? He calls all the cases together and maybe even put one good case somewhere in the middle. 
so that anybody standing beside you, you're not able to pin them to a particular issue. So, ah, this one, you they chop from those wings. <laughs> now, wow. And then the same person that they, you now say, hold the hand of your neighbor. You say, no, I know they hold you, I beg, with the same hand. You know, I begin to judge that person. So he ensured that he at least to a large extent covered the shame of those people. Of course, it was an inspiration from the Holy Spirit to attend to their issue. But in the delivery of the prophetic, there is still a loving way to do it. But by the time you see that, the entire show, the charade, is more about the person giving the prophetic words and is to put the spotlight on him and make him feel more prophetic and more supernatural than every other person in the room, then it's a sign that love is either missing. The person may be a real prophet, but he's already beginning to add some other things that are not of God into those manifestations. And it's just a matter of time. He will soon become Balaam. Do you see? Because the moment greed and um, pride is in the heart of a prophet, even though he starts out with God, he can literally end up as a demon. Because... In the Old Testament, Balaam was a prophet of God. By revelation, he had become a doctrine. And it was a doctrine of devils. The same man, the same Balaam. So people who start out really as prophets under God can evolve into becoming literally doctrines of devils. They become the epitome of those doctrines, like Balaam had become. So love, far more than the manifestations of those gifts, is the most excellent way. So whilst you're manifesting those gifts of the Spirit, ensure that there is love cushioning the delivery of those things. I don't know if this in some way or another answers your question, but listening to that teaching will do a bit more justice. Thank you. But that's a very good question that we all need to, we all need to have perspective on, especially in our, in our day and age. Thank you, sir. Thank can you. Can to Pastor Noso's message? Yes, you can, you can have Pastor Noso. I've gymed small. <laughs> there are a number of other questions as well, but after Pastor Noso. Okay. Hallelujah. Okay, yes. You stated that God isn't looking at accuracy, but sincerity. Yes. And you also say conscience is a big factor when it comes to heresy. Yes. So the question is, how can we judge sincerely in our attempt to save ourselves from heretical doctrines? Very good question. Very good question. So um, now, when I say God is more concerned about sincerity than accuracy, it is not necessarily to the exclusion of accuracy. It's not like you now remove the Bible and start teaching from a notebook and say, yeah, sincerely teaching from a notebook that is not the Bible. Because part of sincerity is an attempt to at least represent the accurate teachings of God's Word as much as you can. That's the sincerity. It's not that when you're teaching, you are deliberately teaching things that are not in the Word of God, but you are sincerely teaching it. That's no longer sincere. Because remember, the last and the most grievous punishment of the entire Bible was reserved for people who add to Scripture and remove from Scripture. And it's reserved at the last chapter of the Bible, all right? Almost the last phrase in the Bible, that anyone who removes or adds to this thing that I've written here, you know, he will strip his name, yank his name out of the book of life. It's a very grievous offense to, to add to Scripture. Now, but I believe strongly that what Jesus is saying there is the spirit of that offense, not so much about if you say something that God's Word did not explicitly say. That means he's taking you out of. But if you are insincere, remember 2 Corinthians 4, seeing that we have received this ministry, even as we have received mercy, we faint not. We renounce every hidden thing of dishonesty. All right? We do not handle the word of God deceitfully. All right? We don't handle God's word deceitfully. We don't walk in craftiness. And those are the key words when it comes to sincerity. How honest are you delivering this thing? How much of due diligence have you taken in the word of God to search out these things, or you're just using the nearest alibi to express your own bias. Do you understand? The Bible said something, but you didn't check other Bibles, other parts of the Bible that said something that may not be directly like this, just to balance that which you have seen. So you ignore every other thing, and you heighten the emphasis on this thing just for your own advantage, so that you can placate your conscience or, you know, make yourself feel like there's nothing wrong with what you are doing and practicing. And usually, Heresies are used to justify practices and actions. So when a person is heretic or heretical in his teachings, it is usually because there is a defect in their lives that they are using a teaching to cushion the effect. So when you see people who live sinful lives and lascivious in their ways of life and all of that, there is, there's a very high chance that it will be more given to hypergrace teachings than the balanced teachings because hypergrace cushions the effect of the conviction that their conscience is throwing at them because I progress keeps telling them that don't worry. And that's why, again, we need to listen to the teaching before the last. You know, how that 
we need to understand that we are man. A man is tripartite. Man is not just one thing, like we have heard all our lives growing up. And this is not to cast any aspersion to, you know, um, Brother Higgins' writings. I believe that truth was necessary to be emphasized in that dispensation. But now that we have grown as a church, all right, and as a global church community, we need to understand that man is tripartite. That is, I am a man because I have a body, because I have a soul, because I have a spirit. That is, those three things make me man. Any part of those three dimensions missing, I'm no longer the man that God created me to be. So until God breathed into man, man was not a living soul. All right? And by the time God was going to even define man, he defined him by his soul. And that's to tell you that, see, you, we need to understand that. So that when these hypergrace teachings come and they tell you that while you are fornicating, your spirit is not fornicating, but it is your body that is fornicating, you can tell the error in that, that or God, you are not being sincere about this. While you are fornicating, your spirit did not contribute in your fornication. It was your soul and your body that contributed in that. And it is defilement. And in fact, the Bible actually goes as far as saying you can actually defile your spirit. And, and those are teachings that some hypergrace, you know, quarters will never allude to that you can actually defile your You can defile your spirit. The Second Corinthians 7, I believe, talks about how that we should cleanse ourselves from every filthiness, all right, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. It was talking about the filthiness of the spirit. That is, you can, you can make your spirit filthy or at least, you know, pressurize your spirit to depart from your body with the kind of filth that you are engaging in consistently. So the Holy Spirit will either have to leave you or um, continue to survive for as long as it can bear that level of pressure. The way uh, Sodom and Gomorrah kept vexing the righteous soul of Lot, that's how the spirit will feel in a situation where both the soul and the body are actively fighting against it in driving the agenda of, of the flesh. Now, um, I know I've veered a little off tangent, but what I'm trying to say here is this. In teaching the word of God sincerely, you've got to strive for accuracy. Do you understand? You can't be teaching God's word sincerely and you have absolutely no um, intention to be accurate. That is, there's something wrong about that. If you're being sincere, that means you are sticking with the boundaries of Scripture to explain what you are explaining. And you have, perf or you have applied a lot of due diligence. You've listened to other teachers. Remember what I talked about, the ex ecclesiastical authority. So you are not just coming up with the truth and that's all you're saying. And you don't care what anybody thinks. You don't care. Paul, even though he said, oh, I, I was thought of no man, he still went to pick that to check if those things that he had been saying were verified by the ecclesiastical authority of the day. You can't be the only person God is giving a revelation. It's a sign that there's something a bit funny about it. The only person in the world. Ah, there's something. Because the spirit of the, of the Lord is the one that is governing the revelations that are dominant, emphasized, and are, you know, holding sway within the body part time. And that's why it will look like sometimes the grace message came and everywhere it was grace. He was the Holy Ghost conducting the availability of doctrinal accuracy or the doctrinal availability of some teachings in the body of Christ. However, because the devil always locks around the corner to take some teachings into an extreme, so when he grabbed hold of the grace message, which was right, which was good, because if you read Romans 1 to 4 or to 6, you will not understand any other thing apart from grace, 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 grace. And that's why there is a Romans... 6 that talks about how that shall we continue in sin that grace may abound. So if you leave your teachings, or if Paul ended his teachings in 5, you probably think all there is to, to this grace is freedom and liberty to sin and do whatever you want to do. So there was that season where the, con the, the condemnation in most teachings was so rife that God had to institute or, you know, introduce the message of grace. And like water in a thirsty land, the, the, the ground was soaking a lot of it because it was so thirsty. But now that the water has saturated the entire land, there is a need for balance. Else, you would even overlog and, you know, flood away the rightly growing plants on that, you know, um, plantation. Because if, if it's not rice or something that requires a lot of water, you will destroy the plant by much more, much more water than is required. Do you understand my point? And so even after you have heard the message of grace, you need to strive for balance. And that's why it looked as though, you know, the orchestra of heaven moved in another direction of consecration. Because people are now taken, by the help of the, de the devil, of course, taking the teachings of grace perhaps to an extreme that it shouldn't have veered off into. So in teaching God's word sincerely, you must strive for accuracy. But whilst you're being you know, sincere and, and all of that, you also know that you are a man. You are growing. You have to give account, and which, is, which is accounted for in humility. That is, if you've taught something that the Holy Spirit confronts you about in the future and tells you this thing you, are, you used to teach is not accurate, come back and correct it. 
Don't continue to insist that what you thought in 1972 is still the right thing. You were growing. You were just a 25-year-old you know, pioneer. You had a lot of things to also learn. So be willing to undo some of the things you've said in the past and then lay on them the truth of God's word that you now know so that your people are also growing. Else you will cap them at the point that none of them will be growing because it is the revelation of 1972 that are still surviving until date. And that's why perhaps they are no longer relevant in our world because they are just living in a bubble of a revelation that their man of God caged them in. And the reason why is because he's not humble enough to admit that at that level, it may have been okay because that was the level of revelation he had. But if he wants to be sincere, he has to debunk those things and then move people to the higher level of understanding in the present day. But that will not suffice as what revelation is addressing that you know, he removed. Because as far as he was concerned in 1972, he was being sincere. Do you understand? And to the extent that he was accurately... Um, you know, um, dissecting the word of truth, he was explaining to the extent that he believed after due diligence, consulting with people, and all of that. Because there was a time there was SU, there was an SU movement. If you were with your, you know, without your scarf, you were a demon, literally. And that was the general atmosphere of the church. And the ecclesiastical authority at the time was fine with it. And now it does appear that there is a movement beyond that point and all of that. But the point is, if you didn't teach maliciously to just benefit yourself, and to sustain an immoral practice or lifestyle personally, then to the extent that you're being sincere, God sees it. And he recognizes that you are being sincere, even though accurately, as far as accuracy go, um, you may not have been so accurate at the time. So that's, that's what I would say about that. I don't know if this answers your question, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir. Okay. Okay. Um, but there are a number of other... Okay. There's someone... So let's prioritize new faces. We'll come to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, thank you very much, sir, for the... Uh, Online. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you for the um, privilege, sir. Um, so my question basically is about an understanding that I've come to get that has actually been influencing um, a, lot, a lot of how much I live my life, right? Um, it's basically about the concept of um, knowledge of good and evil. Right, so um, I mean, um, from the days of Garden of Eden, when um, God actually didn't want Adam and Eve not to eat the fruits of not just the knowledge of evil, but also the knowledge of good. So that means um, is basically at that point not wanting them to know both evil and good. Right, from my understanding of that particular um, verse. Right, but then um, when we look at um, the implication in trying to explain some things like why God will um, order the killing of innocent children. Right, so of course we look at okay, um, knowledge of good and evil is not as superior as that of purpose, right? So good at the purpose at that point in time. So evil and good was probably subject to that. So, but it's easier to um, apply it in our time. For example, you're in the house and Omar comes to the house and uh, tries, wants to rape your sister and you lie that you don't have a sister. A right? lying fundamentally is wrong, but at that point, I mean, it's allowed. So, but when we now try to scale and talk of the instance of, for example, the Brewery case, this is just a random case scenario. And I'm, I'm telling myself that I have a purpose of going in rank in the organization and being able to influence the objective of the organization to probably move from alcohol for brewery production to alcohol for other purpose. So I can decide to say, okay, I want to um, optimize this process for them so I can actually be more valuable to the organization and actually grow in rank. So knowledge, evil and good now is subject to that my purpose. So I'm struggling to actually know <laughs> where is the balance, at what point do I find the balance and ensure that I'm really doing what is right. Interesting, very interesting question. Very interesting question. So, um, I don't even know where exactly to take the response from, but let's start with um, the concept of utility, which you already mentioned about, say, an amber comes around and wants to rape your sister and all of that. Um, I found myself almost involuntarily lying to someone before, and it was, to be very honest, I believed it was an inspiration of the Holy Spirit because I had been kidnapped and they were asking me for money I did not have. So in that moment, I talked in the most amazing light about my father, how he owned several filling stations. I didn't know where those words were coming from. And I told them everything. They believed it. I told them to write their account numbers down. By the next morning, I was going to wire it to their accounts. I said things that if I hear myself again, I'll be like, geez, you are able to do this. Like, it was so, um, it was just very surreal, right? And it was after I left there, fear then came on me because... It was not me that was in that moment. They probably would have killed me if I was trying to be honest. <laughs> so God saved me. All right. Now, um, so when it comes to utility, there are times that 
what you're doing in that point is no longer seen as the literal meaning outside of that context. That is, the meaning of that thing you're doing is now entirely contextual. So in that moment, you are saving your life. You are not lying. You're saving your life because the, 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 the context rubs so much on that action that you know, it's no longer lying in that sense. But of course, like I said, you have to be able to validate this by the outcome and by the inspiration behind what you did. Um, as far as the Bury case goes, um, are you sure you're not really being so passionate about increasing our, you know, growing in ranks and changing the objective of the company because of how juicy the money is? Are there other ways? Do you understand? Because if something is marketable and selling very fast, they don't need the objective to change. They are in that business for the money. Your objective may not improve their bottom line. It may change their objective, but it will improve their bottom line, which will make it no longer an objective. If Bury is selling so wildly, if beer is selling so wildly, it's because people are buying it crazily. That's why drug lords are very rich. Any addiction, you have too many logical reasons to be a customer. This is no longer a matter of value proposition because the only value proposition is destruction. But yet, people are buying it because it services their flesh. It services debauchery. It services uh, addiction. It services um, drunkenness. Addiction to substances. Now, any attempt to help that agenda or that objective, I'm not sure someone who loves God, who is keeping close with his conscience, will be able to live with that. Now, that determines how sensitive you are in terms of your conscience. It, it really depends on how sensitive that person's conscience is. There are people's conscience that have been desensitized from being so sensitive to the voice of the Spirit and to moral reasoning in that sense. And to that extent, people can do those things and justify them. But if you are really being sincere, you know you may not be able to justify it. And no matter how high you rank in that organization, you're not going to be founder. You're not going to be the person that can outrightly change the objective from the ground up. And by the time you change it, let's even say they go in that route for a few months, they will not make money. You want them to be selling water or, or what exactly would they move away from that is not alcohol, that will sell as much as alcohol? <laughs> the reason why alcohol is selling so much is because it feeds people's flesh. So they have a lot of illogical reasons to buy. They don't have money, they will, but they will drink every day. Where are they getting the money from? Well, you understand my point. So it's a very, it's a system that governs itself and that is dominated by the flesh. And you don't want to service such an economy, all right? And, and that's why as Christians, we've got to be so led. Because in our world, we've got to ensure that we are, we are being deployed for the most optimal use to God's kingdom. So maybe a better use of the time would actually be to preach to people and get them saved, rather than walk through the route of um, you know, changing the objective of one beer-making company among the several beer-making companies in the world that will just simply enter into your market if you move to another objective. They will enter into your market and eat up your market size. I mean, and the same damage is still being done. So <laughs> where do you want to start from? So you want to uh, really, like I said, go through these three steps, all right? As far as alcohol goes, alcohol by itself is not necessarily wrong. It's a natural process that produces alcohol and it may not be wrong in that sense. And it's used for a lot of good reasons. But beer as a product is designed to be addictive. Do you understand? And I'm not sure you, you can justify that. And then, of course, if you're doing it not for monetary reasons, so why are you doing it? You know, um, so I don't know if that answers your question, even though I've not really touched on the good and evil bits, which is another kettle of fish entirely. Um, but maybe for now, that, that can suffice. I don't know if that answers your question. Not much, right? Not much. We, we can still talk after service, OK, if that's, if that's fine. Because I know you are still, you're referring to Genesis, you know, knowledge of good and evil and all those things. I need to understand exactly what you're saying in that regard. But I have to touch on, on the, the Beery um, reference. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, okay. We have one person. And we have about two, okay, and we have about 15 questions from the link. And about 10 of those questions about relationships. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to count. So people are smiling and looking. I'm thinking that people are not wanting to ask the relationship questions here. <laughs> no, they are going. They are going the other route. They are the firewall. The <laughs> uh, so we'll take the two questions and then I'll take questions from the link. Um, so, Manuel. 
Thank you. All right. Um, hello, Pastor. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have two questions, actually. Uh, the first Pastors one is... never travel alone. Uh, <laughs> I don't have company. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've asked you this one before. But okay. I sort of want more an explanation, yes. Okay. So, um, the first one is, as a believer, can you eat salami? Okay. First one. <laughs> <laughs> Very relevant question. <laughs> okay, ask the second one. Okay. So the second one is, um, if you invite someone to church, like you invite someone here, whether a Christian or a Muslim, and you know after you invited them, you came, and you were fine, then the next time they decided to invite you to their own, whether it's okay ah. <laughs> Interesting. Oh, How do you manage? Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> so the first one about salamit. If you give me salamit, I will eat it. I don't know if that answers your question. Let me give you a good living example. She's in front of me like this. Pastor Yinka's family is Muslim. What's your Muslim name again, ma? Delilat. But please don't call Pastor Yinka. <laughs> PJLs. <laughs> PJLs. <laughs> Praise God. So she came from a Muslim background and she had to literally travel to her grandma's place in Ikene over the salad break and worked hard to kill salad meat. Did you eat or you did not eat? Uh uh. Before. Yeah, the husband man, uh, I mean, you have to be the first partaker of your effort. So, um, Salami by itself is not the problem, right? Um, and then you can argue and say, well, was it, you know, I mean, is it dedicated to idols, which is what the Bible perhaps, you know, maybe meant when it talks about how you shouldn't eat things that are, you know, dedicated to idols. So there is that conversation around it. But in a general sense, right, salami um, is a celebratory, you know, gesture that Muslims offer. Now, my only challenge would be that if someone around you who perhaps is a babe, who is new in the faith, has a strong opinion about eating salamit or not eating salamit, and the person is around you, for the purpose of that person's continued salvation, you can choose not to eat salamit because of that person. There is nothing wrong with salamit, but if eating meat will cause my brother to stumble, then I'm not a vegetarian. Do you understand the, the idea? So that's the major reason. So it's a utilitarian decision, not a principle decision. It's not that salamit is wrong, this one is wrong. No, it's a utilitarian decision that what, who will benefit, apart from my tummies and, <laughs> you know, uh, what would, who will benefit from eating this meat and who might suffer for my eating of this meat? If nobody suffers and I get blessed by, you know, if you give me salamit now, that means it will remove from my budget for meat this month. You understand? Yeah, so it will bless my family if you give me, and I'm not asking for people to give me salami because I know Muslims here, but I'm just giving you the gist that if I'm giving salami, I'll really be grateful for that. Do you see? Um, and I'll bless the person because also we need to stay, we need to understand that the power really is with us. We can't be avoiding people because, oh, you know, they serve, they, the, the most, the most important thing you need to guard yourself against when it comes to negative influences is the ideology somebody is spewing and to ensure that it does not enter your heart. As far as the other things like accessories, you know, clothing, you know, jewelry, food, all those things are concerned, you can take them the very, you know, without thinking so hard about them because those things are not the things that defile. Jesus made it very clear that those are not the things that really defile. It's the things that enter into your heart, the things that make your mind up, the things that govern your thinking and your ideology. Are you spending so much time with a Muslim that you are now beginning to think that Jesus is no longer the son of, the, of God? That's the real toxin, not the salami they will give you. It will make you a Muslim. It will make you a non-Christian. It, it can't impact anything on you, especially now that you have the name of Jesus to cleanse everything that is not of God that it comes into your hand. You sanctify everything in the name of Jesus, and you sanctify it, and that's what the Bible teaches because you don't know what is, what is dedicated to anything. You really don't know. The Amala you enjoy, you don't know. Do you understand? But the point is, once it gets to my table, even if I don't sanctify it, if it enters my mouth, it is already sanctified. 
Because Bible says that you will take up anything deadly and it will not harm you. All right, so you have a lot of reinforcement in Christ to not go about walking on eggshells, whether you want to engage with someone, you want to collect salami from them. By the time you say no, you already even you you already limited the opportunity of ever reaching that person in a you know successive interaction. By the time you say no to their salami, why would they say yes to your invitation to come to a cell meeting or come for a birthday party or take their, your own Christian cake too? You understand my point? So take the salami, eat it, enjoy it, wish them well, pray for them, stay friends with them, but of course do not imbibe their ideological constructs and ideals. Do you understand? That, that I think is the more important, is the more important thing. All right? So by all means, my brother, chop away. <laughs> Now, the second question about the guy who comes because you invited him and now he's going to wherever he is, maybe club or something, um, you have every right under God to say no to that, all right? He didn't, he didn't offer you, you didn't um, put him under duress to get him to church, and you also did not have him come as, or he did not necessarily come, or let me put it this way, you didn't have him come over to your side as a credit for a potential invitation to his side, even when whatever it is he's going to be inviting you to come do is not consistent with your value system. The reason why he came was not because you forced him to come. He came because he saw the invitation, and there was nothing in him that negated the alignment or the agreement to come for that event. If he's not inviting you to something, and you say no, and he's angry because he came to yours, and you're not coming to him, that is manipulation right there. That is manipulation. So I give you something because I can give you. I'm not asking you to give me some, but you can't give it. But I'm not angry that you can't give it. That means I gave you to collect, and that's manipulation. Do you understand? So um, if he came, he came because he wanted to come, and whatever he met did not contravene his ideals or his ideology or his morals, right? Instead, it inspired him or something. If he's inviting you over to somewhere, even if that thing will bless you, you still have the right to say no. It's your decision. And if the person will get angry, that means the person is being manipulative. That means the person is being manipulative. If someone honestly invites you to something, they can't force you to come. It's an invitation. That's the whole idea of an invitation. They can choose to come or not come. It's not, you know, under gunpoint and then, you know, show up and then once I come, you also owe me attendance in my own club. No. It doesn't work that way. So that, that's what I would say about that. Thank you. And then yeah. Okay. Good morning. Okay. Good morning, church. Um, my question is in regards to the work gossip. Okay. So I understand when, okay, this has nothing to do with our work, like this is just to slander somebody. But when there's stories or, for lack of a better term, gossip mm. that goes around that maybe gives you context on how to relate and work with people um, in the workplace, how do you go about kind of filtering in or with that, you know, you gave the example of like stopping them so it never comes to you. With that, you can isolate yourself yeah, and yeah. you have, yeah. you know, you go around working without having, like there's something that could happen yeah, that yeah. you having that information yeah. could help you know how to relate or, you know, go about a certain work thing. And how do you go about that without fully isolating yourself at work? Good question, good question. So what I would say is, um, like I had said before, you need to determine if something is actually qualified as gossip first. If it is not slanderous, with no intention to spread, or I mean false narratives about someone, it's actually a true expression of, say for example, you join the company, and if someone walks up to you and says, um, now in this organization, this is how we roll, or you literally ask someone, that, how, how do things work in this organization? I mean, part of that question is the person telling you about people, personalities, hierarchies, structures, who can accept this, who cannot accept that, who is not, um, who is a no-nonsense person, who is a more toler tolerant, um, you know, manager or something, and then you are just better aided or equipped to navigate the political climate in that work or in that organization, right? That, I don't think, is qualified as gossip. All right, that is someone who means well for you, who is trying to tell you what the terrain is like. All right, and there is a legitimate way to go about that. All right, um, so that, that's what I would say. As, and that's why I said, you know, there are, there are friendly ways to let someone know that I'm not open to this kind of conversation. 
Because you're not casting aspersion on the person. You're just telling the person that I, I don't do this thing that you are bringing to my table. It doesn't mean I hate you for all purposes and reasons. I still, you can be a colleague, you can be a friend, whatever it is. And if it's a boss, there's not much you can do. You'll be smiling. As well. You'll be smiling. The person is gossiping with you. Do you understand? So there are ways to address it, but you ensure that it stops with you. Become an insulator to whatever it is that is transmitted. Um, but like I said, as far as the political climb in your organization goes, you can't isolate yourself in the name of, oh, you want to be so insulated from gossip, all right? Because what, not everything that is talked about in the organization can qualify as gossip. I, I really don't think so. If someone is describing someone else to you, now the person may be graphic, exaggerating, and all of those things. It may qualify as gossip in that sense, all right? And of course, because at work, these are not Christians in that sense, and they may have ulterior motives. You may not even know exactly why they're telling you. Sometimes someone may come in as someone who means well for you, maybe different from the other guy that I described, as someone who actually means well for you and is giving you updates about how the organization works. Someone may come in almost with a tip, like a help, and it's actually a bait, like what the devil did with Eve. And it's almost like, uh, you know, this is how you can do this, and then it's, it's all shrouded under a lot of insincerity and all of that. You need to pray. You need to be led by the Holy Spirit. You, know, you need to know the people to really connect with. You need to know the people who you need to keep at, at arm's length. You need to know the people who you need to have on your, on your, on, um, uh, in your corner, but not on your bed. You know, that kind of thing. It, they, are, they are acquaintances. You don't need them too far away because you need them for information, but you don't necessarily need them to be your buddy, your friends, your, you know, your guys that you eat with you know, at lunchtime and all that. You need a lot of wisdom, which is why the Bible tells us that in this world, you need wisdom to navigate. You've got to be as wise as a serpent, but as gentle as a dove. Uh, but don't be the one who will push, because you may not be able to avoid gossip coming on your table, quite honestly. But there is a lot you can do in ensuring it does not go from your table to another table. And if it's a subordinate, if it's somebody you can actually talk very firmly to, you talk very firmly to that person. If it's someone you can't talk firmly to, you do your best to endure the conversation until it's over and then ensure it stops on your desk. All right? We obviously cannot insulate ourselves. I would say this again, Jeremiah 29. You know that verse of scripture that we talk about how that I know the thoughts that I have towards you. That was, you know, God talking to the children of Israel that, see, when you get to Babylon, don't go and be isolating yourself and insulating yourself from engagement. So somebody's a Muslim, he's selling cars, you will not buy from them. Somebody is a, a pagan. He creates Facebook. You will not be on Facebook. Someone is this, you know, and then you want to just isolate yourself. He said, go, in fact, marry from amongst them, engage in business, grow in ranks, because you'll be here for a long time. That's what God was just trying to tell them. You'll be here for a long time. But in coordinating your affairs, you must be the one that has that commitment and your convictions to the word of God, to the Jewish tenets and covenants. Do you understand? And I think that's a very instructive. The verses before 11 gives you very strong perspective. Let's quickly look at it very quickly. So that you realize that you, you may not be able to disengage from literally every context you find yourself and say, well, I'm trying to be a saint in that sense. And then, um, where is it? The verses just before this. Um, okay, how about verse 12? Is it verse 6? Okay, good. Thank you. Verse 6. Good. Take you wives, you know, verse 5, 4. Thus said the Lord of us, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives from whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. So he's talking to people that have been carried away to Babylon. And this word is a type of Babylon. I hope you understand that. Build you houses, dwell in them, plant gardens, eat from the fruit of them. All right? Take ye wives, begat sons and daughters, take wives for your sons, give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that they may be increased in there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city, whether I have caused you to be carried away. That is, pray for Babylon. <laughs> you understand? Uh, and pray unto the Lord for it, for in the peace thereof ye shall have, have peace. So, this is a type of guiding mantra for when you find yourself in a very dark space and there's nothing you can do to eliminate yourself from it except you die or except, because there's no better place in that sense. Um, you've got to continue to um, rely on the wisdom of God to navigate those terrains. I hope that helps. Thank you, sir. So I'll take yes, two questions from um, the audience, from the link here. Um, one is, sir, do you believe a lady should put herself out there um, on social media? For example, there's this thread, um, Igbo, Igbo women thread on, so on Twitter. That okay. That's been going on for a while now. I think they did Igbo men the other day. 
um, so do you believe a lady should put herself out there on a thread or uh, people should be on dating apps, um, okay. dating platforms? That's question one. Um, second question is, how do you deal with overthink overthinking? Wow, okay, so the first question, do you think a person should put herself on trends? Yeah, or put herself on social media. On social the, media. With the intention to Attract. meet a potential guy, yeah. Oh, okay, like dating apps and all. I will not make or legislate a, you know, um, a rule around that. I, I won't do that. God can work in very mysterious ways, honestly. And God can continue to work with new methods that technology affords us, all right? Um, Abraham's um, servant did not need technology to locate um, Isaac's babe, yeah. right? Um, you know, Ruth did not need technology to locate Boaz, yeah. um, even though she needed counsel. Um, however, as the world evolves, the multiplied channels that God could use to reach a man continues to multiply. Yeah. There are a lot of us here that are here because of Facebook, that you are here because of Instagram, right? So the way perhaps the Antioch church was populated is not the way our church is going to be populated because we are not in the second or third century. Yeah. Do you understand my point? Yeah. So um, a, dating app, a dating app may be useful, all right, but... The bigger question, really, that I would ask is why. Mm. I, I don't think it is a question of is it wrong to be on a dating app as much as why do you want to be on a dating app, you know? Um, and that's something that God can actually justify with you. He can actually give you that instruction. Say, go on that dating app. There's a guy I have for you there or something. I don't know. I'm not going to say God will never be able to use a dating app to get two people interested in themselves. No, because the dating app is just an aggregation platform. The same way an event is like an app. Do you understand? It's just a platform where people can come together and meet themselves. So sometimes when we call them dating apps, then we sort of vilify them in that sense and make it look like, of course, I can say that a lot of not so good things happen. A lot of not so good people meet and then they, you know, pretend for themselves for a number of months and impress themselves and get uh, into all kinds of things. Um, but if we look at it in terms of what exactly it does, it's just to aggregate people of similar interests together. And an event can pass for that, even though it's just more or is less, is more short-lived in that sense. An event we had on Thursday perhaps can pass for that. You know, it was a platform where people were going to meet other people. Do you understand? So, as far as the essential service that a dating app offers is concerned, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. You understand? But um, if you are going there so you can pretend and then show off an impression of someone that is perfect, that has all the shape and all that, so that you can increase your chances of being attracted or being attractive to someone, then all that nuance, the Holy Spirit definitely will cut them off, very likely. All right, but it's still very possible for you to be on a dating app and it's used by God. I, I, I think that, I think that's possible. Um, then the second question about overthinking. how do you overthinking. avoid overthinking? Yes, sir. Don't stop overthinking. Uh, <laughs> um, overthinking is a habit. It can become a habit very quickly. So. What you want to do is replace overthinking with meditation. And it's very, very easy. It's a very, the segue is so smooth, <laughs> right? So you're overthinking, overthinking. Look for the scripture that addresses that issue you're thinking about. Think about the, the word of God that addresses the thing you're thinking about. Oh, rent, rent. Ah, we'll help him rent. Oh, money, money. Ah, you're overthinking. Oh, relationship. Look into scripture. And because the word of God has something to say about literally everything in your life. So when you look into scripture and you see what God's word said about, you know, um, I mean, I, I, I heard a testimony of a man who got his car by reading Psalms 91, that the Bible says, the sun shall not smite you by day. And he focused on the sun shall not smite you by day. The sun shall not smite me by day. Wow, the sun shall not smite me by day. The sun shall not smite me by day. And he continued to admit until he got the car. Wow. That was his route to getting a car. He may have started with a worry about, how do I move around this Lagos, this traffic, this issue, and he's worrying and he's over, overthinking. And then he moves into Psalm 91, and he sees wow. the sun shall not smite you by day. That means the AC, the car said must have AC. So that sun shall not smite you by day is not a, any kind of car. Yeah. It has to be a car that can insulate you from the sun <laughs> that will smite those that are not inside cars. Do you get the point? So yeah. but th that was a meditative approach. So that was what I would say. Um, we're human beings. Our minds run wild and all of that. So once your, your mind begins to run almost like... You know, when the system is running programs underground and it's just, it's just there, you're just always thinking about that thing. Convert it into a scriptural verse that you can meditate on and mull over and just continue to go over that word. And you'll be surprised how enriching it will be to your soul. So 
anxiety is an invitation to prayer and to meditate, really. Thank you, sir. Great. Thank you, Pastor. Um, so I'm, I'm struggling to pick questions here. Um, somebody asked a funny question here. It says, <laughs> okay, so um, it says, how can you run away from women? <laughs> what really? <laughs> he said, what I mean is that there is a stage in life where women begin to come around as a guy. So how can you flee from distractions from women? Sorry, I'll probably real. <laughs> <laughs> how, do, how do you run away? You can't run away. <laughs> the only run away is to die. And even when you die, you open up to Mary in heaven or something. Because <laughs> you, you can't run away from women. Because what happens if they also try to run away from you too? You know, like... Um, you can't do that. So what do you do is to build your self-control. That's the real problem here. That's the real problem here. The problem there is the fact that, you know, you, you have so many triggers. That's the real problem. You have so many triggers that just seeing a lady is enough a trigger. The lady is not the problem. The problem is the triggers you have. And you need to, you need to, you know, mortify the deeds of the flesh. And like we've been teaching at, you know, comms, there is no simple, nice, cute way to do this. It's brutal. It's either the flesh is enthroned or is what? It's either the flesh is enthroned or what? Yes. There is no middle ground. So you either enthrone the flesh and you make it run your life, or you enslave it and allow the spirit to run your life. And that means mortify, brutally, you know, beat it and put it under, like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9. And so... What you need to do is to be trained, is to listen to teachings, is to be accountable, is to go through consecrations, is to study your Bible, is to pray, is to go through all of those quote-unquote disciplines of a disciple, and you would increase your firewalls against the onslaught of carnality. That's the only way. And the moment you stop doing those things, the firewall starts coming down, and then those things cannot come in again. Nobody can ever outgrow the tendency for you know, sexual promiscuity. Nobody. So if say, this person does not have a woman problem. It's not quite true. Except you were given from above, which is what Jesus himself alluded to, that it's possible that God gave some people the gift of um, uh, eunuchs. That is, you can be born with absolutely no affection for the opposite gender. And those are the kind of people that we had you know, in the palaces that were taking care of the likes of Esther, you know, in the palace of the king. They were eunuchs. So they didn't have, so the king was not afraid that he would sleep with the girls that he was training for him. So, because they were eunuchs. They didn't have affection for ladies, and it's given from above. But there are people who separate themselves, like Paul said, himself is also an example. But for the most of us, we will have to ensure that we keep ourselves under control, because marriage will not cure it. You have to put your body under, all right? And avoid the things you need to avoid, but don't now be so, um, you know, full of triggers that just a lady appearing, just a lady coming to your office, just a lady being fine, just a lady, you know, it's already a trigger. You're already feeling like... And by the time I investigate into that kind of a person, I'm sure there are issues of pornography, masturbation, a lot of other underlying issues that are making that person so easily triggered. And those things need to be addressed. All right? So I would say if you are in this situation, see a pastor. See someone. You can't handle this by yourself. You need to be accountable. You need to be put under some measure of accountability structure. All right? That's what I would say. Great. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So, um, there are quite a number of questions here, but our time wow. is fast spent. And um, let's, let's, can we take some more time, say 10 minutes? Is that fine? This yes is not very strong. <laughs> so let's have to go forth and then we'll move on. It's fine. We don't have to, we don't have to. Do more than we've already done. The yes was not resounding, so it's fine. Let's have go forth. You can project, yes. Oh, do you need to talk about it privately? Okay. I, okay. Sorry, everybody. I don't mean to embarrass myself. Or embarrass no, no, don't embarrass yourself. It's fine. <laughs> we'll talk about it later. No, it's so fine. It, it, I think it's something everyone will benefit. It's fine. Okay. Go for it. It's fine. You. We can talk about it um, after now, and then, you know, we'll address it, okay?
if you really have questions, right, you don't have to wait for LQs. I hope you know. If you have questions in your heart, you don't have to wait three months, four months, till another round of series is over, and then we go for an LQ. Um, you can walk up to any pastor. You can walk up to myself to ask your questions, and we will answer. I send VNs almost every day. <laughs> if you have received a VN from me, let me see your hand. You can, you can imagine. You've received a VN from me. <laughs> I send VNs almost every day, multiple times sometimes, you know, and I'll pick up from where I left off, almost like a sermon. If you compile the VNs <laughs> on your WhatsApp, uh, it's already a teaching. So you can send questions, you can ask any question, because that's the reason why we're here, okay? So this opportunity is just to ensure that we interject a long teaching series with some applicable questions that we hopefully can apply in our lives. And the idea actually is to skew the questions to be more in alignment with the teachings, really, so that we have opportunity to ask questions about what we have been learning so far. Even though, of course, you know, we have the liberty to ask any other kind of question. So that's the objective for LQ, but it does not mean our questions are only limited to LQ Sundays. Um, so I guess on that note, we can round off. Um, over to you, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can we appreciate Pastor Beta? Can we appreciate Pastor Beta? Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so, so, so much, sir. Um, I was just going to um, ask, so we have, so, so for these questions, um, are there provisions are for a way to get answers to people and the ones oh, that we don't Another answer. thing we could do, and that's why we've been increasing the opportunities for many of these questions with the likes of L, um, L and C, all right, loud and clear. We've had two editions of that, and it's all questions that we answer on those editions. So um, we'll keep providing more and more platforms for these questions to be answered, all right, so that it can benefit more people, because the private ones only benefit one person. So um, I guess the next LQ would we'll prioritize the questions that were not asked today. Great. Church, can we say, Pastor, we love you? Pastor, we love you. God bless you. Thank you. You can have a seat. Hallelujah. <laughs>